Here we sit on the eve of Ruby Volume 5, and after many, many months of wait and almost two entire years of producing content, we've finally reached my 100th video here on YouTube. I couldn't have asked for a more fitting topic, and to celebrate that, I'd like to ask all of you to uh, pause the video, go grab a glass of your favorite drink, and raise a toast with me, because I sure as hell couldn't have gotten here without any of you guys supporting me. You've waited for it, I've been working on it, I've lost brain cells, sleep, and dignity to it. Here's hoping you all enjoy it. Fixing Ruby, Volume 1. Kanpai, everybody! Well, we've finally made it, haven't we? I say that like it's an accomplishment when really we're only now actually covering the series proper two installments in. Now, you might be wondering if I'm going to be covering the trailers, which fluctuate in canonicity, and I decided that instead of covering them separately, I'm just going to tackle them here before getting into the main segments of the series. Now, if there's one thing I can credit Ruby, it's that the trailers before the series actually aired were pretty damn engrossing and raised plenty of questions that would be touched upon later in the series. The only downside of this is that many of these elements don't really come into any kind of fruition until two or three volumes after the first. I think the only major things that played out into anything immediate were the assault on the train introducing Blake's detachment from the White Fang, and Roman briefly showing up in the Yellow trailer. Still, the trailers are for the most part just fine, so the only tweaks I'll make are relatively minor. First is the white trailer, where at the end, among the clapping crowd, we get a glimpse of Jacques, Winter, and maybe even Whitley. It just has to be partial, but getting something like an uneasy glance from Weiss and a nod of approval from Jacques would help to contextualize that the royal test in Mirror Mirror is a more familial burden and not a strictly social one. Not a major change, but one that could help viewers more quickly understand Weiss's predicament starting out. The red trailer doesn't really need to be touched on, and it's easily the simplest of the bunch. The only addendum I'm going to throw in there is that the Grimm that Ruby fights are young fledglings, indicated by their lack of bony carapace. This allows her pre-show power level to actually take them all on. I'm tempted to also make her arguably a little more winded during the fight to show some struggle to keep up with the amassed odds. The yellow trailer has a few adjustments to it so that Yang doesn't come out of it with an arrest warrant like she should have in the original. The biggest change comes when she's picking Junior's brain at the beginning of the trailer. See, she's insistent that he knows something about the woman in her photo. After telling her he doesn't know anything, instead of grabbing him by the balls, she instead playfully flicks to the next picture on her phone, which just so happens to be a picture that she took coming in of him and Roman having a conversation. She threatens to forward the photo to the police and the media if she doesn't get the answer she wants. In turn, Junior orders one of his guards to take her phone, at which point she breaks the guy's arm. This kind of keys him into that maybe she's a huntress combined with the fact that she's armed, and Junior orders the club to empty and for all his guards to close in, clearing the room of witnesses. As he and Yang begin to circle, the rest of the trailer plays out normally. At the very end, after knocking Junior out of the building, Yang straddles him, demanding answers only to realize he's out cold. She drops him to the ground, saying he's useless before running into Ruby, and the trailer ends as normal. This addition helps ease a few issues and establish some facts about the world. That Junior appears to be an upstanding businessman who has a reputation to keep publicly. That Roman Torchwick is a major criminal element powerful enough to damage that reputation. 
that Yang cares less about the law and more about getting what she wants, and that she's streetwise enough to know how to play in the deeper end of Vale's criminal underbelly. She's smart, resourceful, more capable in a fight, and quick on the draw, which meshes well with the sweet, flirty, dumb blonde veneer she puts on. Most importantly though, this gives us reason for the fight sequence beyond. Well, honestly, there really wasn't one besides Yang just deciding to kick the shit out of some dudes for no reason. That was a more substantive change, but the largest change that'll leave the most impact from these changes in the full context of the show comes in the Black trailer. When the trailer starts, the first thing we see is Blake as she was in the original version, sans one thing, her signature bow. In the original version, Blake wearing her bow at this point always confused me as it raised a number of questions about how exactly she was hiding her identity from the White Fang when Adam saw her with the bow on before she left. And because he didn't comment on it during the first trailer, I think it's safe to assume that this was a normal ensemble for her, so if the White Fang would try to find her, they probably could do so without much effort. Hell, considering how few characters wear a bow and have dark hair, it arguably makes her easier to identify. By having her don the bow at the end of the trailer as she's out of eyeshot from Adam, it makes a more convincing disguise. This also changes the dynamic between Blake and the audience during the first volume. We are now in the know of a new fact that all the other characters aren't, allowing us to contextualize Blake's behavior on the fly instead of in retrospect. Now, let it be known that I liked Blake's reveal in Volume 1, it being one of the best setup reveals in the series, but I feel that doing this not only avoids those pesky little plot holes, but also opens up new forms of tension and dynamic to explore when we finally arrive at Beacon. Speaking of which... Probably one of the most important changes I'm implementing is the complete shirking of the idea of volumes and instead implementing a more traditional season format consisting of about 20 10-minute episodes apiece, which pushes the series' runtime to be just shy of a normal 12 or 13 episode anime season. This gives us a little more breathing room to make changes, and we know that Roots Teeth is able to produce a show on this scale thanks to Red vs. Blue. This change, however, is not just to give us more time to work with, it's also a move to refine our focus in the show. One of the bigger issues Ruby has is that its volumes don't really tell their own internal story. To quote Fat Man Falling, The biggest problem with Ruby Volume 1 is that there isn't a plot. By making the volumes into seasons, we set a very clear message that there will be a main plot thread that concludes at the end of the 20 episode run, while also leaving enough threads and ideas open for future expansion instead of just the smattering of small story arcs we got instead. Now also keep in mind that this is a very rough overview, and I'm going to be hitting a lot of points that are going to be changed from the original material. At the same time, there's going to be background details and ad-libs that I don't touch on, and in fact, it may seem like some places that there's not enough to go into filling a whole 10 minute episode. A lot of those kinds of details will be fleshed out in the individual episode scripts, but if I tried to do that, this entire video would go on way too long and take roughly 5 months to produce, what with all the additional writing and editing that I have to do. So in a sense of getting this to you guys in a timely fashion and out before Volume 5 airs, please allow me a little bit of slack with the details. As always, if you feel I've missed something important or something doesn't quite add up, please Please leave a comment down below and I'll do my damnedest to address it in the follow-up video. So Season 1 begins without any introduction or preamble, instead cutting out all the narration by Jen Taylor and skipping right to the events of the show proper. Torchwick, in the same way as the original canon, is wordlessly shown to be a powerhouse of charisma, trading his way to the dust shop with his goons completely unopposed. Intimidating, confident, and suave, he makes his demands to the shop owner, wanting the cash but also demanding every ounce of dust the shop has to offer, saying it'll be more valuable than the piddling amounts of Lien in the cash register. This, along with the way the dust is retrieved and stored by the goons, will give the audience an indication of the value of dust. Of course, then comes the fateful moment when one of the goons tries to hold up Ruby and the fight from episode 1 unfolds as normal until Roman steps in. He's quick to overpower Ruby, but before he can make a dry quip and finish her, Glinda appears and fights him, easily turning the tides against him. Desperate, he reaches into one of the dust cases and uses one of the crystals to cause an explosive distraction to slip away. Cut forward and Ruby is interrogated by Ozpin and Goodwitch, with her admittance in the beacon secured thanks to a rather adept work she did during the fight. The end of the episode proceeds as it once did, only it's simply some extended interactions between Ruby and Yang as they discuss Ruby's anxiety over being two years everyone's junior, but ultimately concluding with Ruby hyping over seeing Beacon come up on the horizon. 
Already, thanks to context clues, demonstration, and behaviors, the audience has an idea of the relative power levels between each character and their status in the setting, giving them a nice idea of where the protagonist stands and how far they have the potential to go. Episode 2 will start with a news report by Lisa Lavender talking about the White Fang, which was originally at the end of Episode 1. This helps to front-load the necessary exposition about the Faunus instead of backloading it like the original first episode did, and contextualize the confrontation between Blake and Weiss with a much greater scope. You could even have Blake on the airship with them, in the background, reacting to the report with frustration or remorse, or some combination of the two. Because, you see, we the audience know she's a Faunus, and this will help us understand more of what happened back in the Black trailer. Glenda gives her little speech during the approach, and we can even have the gag with John vomiting into a nearby trash can to get an early visual establishment of him as a character. This is all followed by Yang giving Ruby the slip as she did initially, though her friends group is going to at least have some visual definition, as later in the season they're going to have some plot relevance. In response, Ruby groans about having to handle their luggage on their own. While struggling to tear the bags free, she accidentally knocks over Weiss's bags, covering herself in red dust. Weiss enters and gets indignant, both with Ruby and with her staff for putting the bags in the public pool instead of just taking them straight to the main hall. Ruby sneezes, she and Weiss explode, and Blake does her best catfight routine on Weiss's pride. In retrospect, the original version of the scene was actually pretty good with delivering a hefty amount of exposition in a short amount of time while also keeping it diegetic, relevant and easy to absorb. By simply adding some of the few previously mentioned elements, such as the baggage pool and the news report, we've shorn up some of the lazy writing contrivances that led to this conversation, while also keeping the idea of the faunus and the racism against them fresh in the viewer's mind. So kudos to Miles and Carrie, this rather important scene, at least from a basic narrative standpoint, was already effective. Things proceed normally from there, what with Ruby meeting John and Ospin giving his speech, though Ospin's language is also going to be far more foreboding regarding the grim and the threat they pose. After that is a brief little segment with Tortric returning to his base of operations. He's in a terrible mood after that robbery's near-complete failure. He goes to a more lavishly decorated room and we're introduced to Neo, who is currently sick and bedridden with an unspecified illness. Roman checks to see if she's doing better, to which she nods, and he responds somewhat warmly, noting that he's got something big planned and he'll need her by his side in order to make it work. He looks at the full moon, and we transition back to Beacon, where the remaining bulk of the episode focuses on the nighttime shenanigans at the school, which formally introduces many of the characters to each other, and is of course the first time all of Team Ruby is in the same place together. This goes on to establish a lot of important dynamics. Ruby and Blake bond somewhat over books, but their differing views on heroism. Yang's almost immediate dismissal of Blake as a lost cause, but similarly her desire to have Ruby make new friends. And it reaffirms the friction between Weiss, Ruby, and Yang. Episode 3 begins, and it flows smoothly into the initiation arc, what with introducing the two best characters in the show, Pyrrha and her fame, and setting up the dynamic between John, Pyrrha, and Weiss that'll carry somewhat into Season 2. In addition, we get a small introduction for Cardin, who will be playing a larger role in this season than he did previously, and indeed will have his own share of focus in the near future. But for now, he simply blows past John, and we get a good impression that he's kind of an ass. When we get to the launch pads, Ozpin explains the scenario and rules that go into the initiation, that they have to link up with a partner through locking eyes, find a relic, and get to the predetermined location programmed on a map on their scrolls that'll activate once they get said relics. But there's a key difference here. There are no Grimm in the forest, at least not that anyone is aware. Yes, the major threats this time around are simply violent wildlife that inhabit the forest. Wolves, bears, a few unique creatures to remnant like squirrel-chimpanzee hybrid creatures, and amphibious crocodile monsters that dot the forest. This is done in order to play up the threat of the Grimm. After all, if the students can't take on a normal brown bear, how are they expected to take on an Ursa? One of the students will of course raise the question of how Grimm are being kept out, but Osman cuts him off by beginning the initiation. As with before, everyone is quickly launched out into the forest. Episodes 4 through 6 are the remainder of the initiation with all the appropriate pairs coming together. Ruby and Weiss, Blake and Yang, John and Pyrrha, Ren and Nora, and new to the paradigm Cardin and Russell, which goes to show Cardin's domineering presence and ability to pressure people. In addition, we get cuts to Ozpin, who is not only monitoring the situation, but also artificially manipulating the forest in order to ensure certain pairs come together, a la how the operators manipulate the arena and the Hunger Games. Ruby, Weiss, John, and Pyrrha's first meeting occurs as normal, though instead of it being Beowulves that attack Weiss, it's regular wolves. Yang and Blake are slightly different, though. Their meeting happens just as it did before, with Black Bears and Otter Hursai, 
But a later scene shows the two grinding against each other's nerves. In particular, when Yang's boisterous nature ends up startling a few of those squirrel chimpanzee monsters I mentioned earlier. This ends up forcing the two of them to flee towards the temple in response, and the creatures rampage through the rest of the forest. Blake is of course pissed by this, and instead of yelling, gives Yang the cold shoulder as they approach the temple. Yang does most of the talking here, noting how some of the relics are already gone, and even though she's still mad, Blake has no choice but to crack a small, short smile at Yang's pony line, showing the first inklings of more chemistry beyond their personality conflicts. Meanwhile, with Ruby and Weiss, the two discover the Nevermore sleeping in a rather old, tattered tree. The two are shocked at finding a Grimm, especially one so old, as Weiss points out, here in the forest when Osmond said there wouldn't be any. The two decide to avoid it, but are suddenly forced to flee towards it as the squirrel chimpanzees that Yang had stirred up come rampaging towards them. This in turn leads to Ruby's crazy idea to latch onto the Nevermore and ride it, which brings them to the temple in short order. Meanwhile, meanwhile, John and Pira have their explanation of Aura, and this is the first point where we have Pira confused by John's lack of knowledge on the matter. He brushes it off and they move along. During this, of course, is Ren sneaking around a King Taijitsu, which can hear him but cannot see him. Even with how quiet he is, it flails violently and he gets knocked into a tree, flaring his aura to demonstrate Pira's point. He's only rescued by Nora, who drives by on a bear and kills one of the King Taijitsu's heads before picking up Ren and running into the distance. John and Pira run into Cardin and Russell, who are observing the cave thinking it might lead them to the relics. Cardin, being a douche, decides to manipulate John and Pira into the cave so they can act like canaries in a coal mine. Pun not intended. But I'm writing this, and I'm leaving it in, does that mean it's still unintended? Or, you know what, screw it, let's just move on. Of course, this leaves John and Pira to go in the cave, and after not hearing from them for a little while, Cardin and Russell move on, only to run into Ren, Nora, and the King Taijitsu that chases them all off towards the temple. The chase ends when the squirrel chimps temporarily cross the King Taijitsu's path and forces it to change directions from its prey, giving Ren, Nora, Cardin, and Russell some breathing room to get their relics. Back in the cave, John and Pira come across a Deathstalker, and things proceed as they did before, with John getting flung and Pira being chased. Finally, all of the different characters converge and we come to the first major climax of the season. John and Ruby retrieve their respective relics, Pira comes breaking through the tree line with the Deathstalker in tow, and everyone prepares to get the hell out of the forest. The problem, they all realize? The evac site is beyond the all three massive Grimm stalking them. With their only path blocked, Ruby leads the charge by running past Pira to attack the Deathstalker. She almost gets herself killed, but Yang and Weiss manage to save her. While this is happening, John notices the ruins and explains that if they lure the Grimm to the ruins, the ten of them will have a better collective chance of circumventing the monsters and making a break for the evac site. They all make a run for the temple, barely fending off the three monsters as they go, and during it we get a glimpse of both Ruby and John keeping an eye on the people around them. This comes into play when they get cornered at the temple instead. Weiss begins shouting out orders for people to take, trying to gather a plan. But Ruby, who has a clear understanding of people's abilities at this point, disagrees. During their argument, Russell, the only person to actually listen to Weiss's setup plan, gets injured and is barely rescued in time by Blake. Meanwhile, the bridge falls through and what will become Juniper are stranded on the opposite side of the gorge with Cardin, the King Taijitsu, and the Deathstalker. While John manages to coordinate with Pira, Ren, and Nora, Cardin manages to solo the somewhat weakened King Taijitsu and take it out, displaying his raw talent for being a huntsman right out of the gate. Across the way, Ruby decides she's not taking any more shit and figuratively sits Weiss, Blake, and Yang down to explain her plan, at the end of which the Nevermore manages to circle back and destroys the last of the upper portion of the temple, and Team Ruby finally leaps into action to deliver the killing blow. Now, with more organization and a crazy plan behind them, of which only Ruby and Yang are confident in, the team gets into position, and Ruby's banter with Weiss about taking the shot shows how they too have more positive chemistry that's been buried by mistake and circumstance. Boom! Ruby kills the Nevermore, and across the way, Team Juniper manages to kill the Deathstalker. Ruby strikes a heroic pose at the top of the cliff, and the scene cuts to Ospin and Glinda watching the events unfold. They converse about how they should not have been any Grimm in the forest and the ruins should have been keeping the Grimm out. Glenda, though upset, remarks that it was only a matter of time before the ruins' ability to repel the Grimm ceased working. Ospin, however, sees something more foreboding than just chance at play. 
With that, we fade into the team's coronation ceremony, where Team Cardinal has just been announced being led by Cardin. Juniper is then called forward and formed, and John is announced as its leader, prompting Nora to slap his back and Pira to put a proud hand on his shoulder, though he himself looks incredibly uneasy about it. Lastly is of course Team Ruby, led by Ruby Rose, which leads to Weiss staring in horrified disbelief. Blake simply has her eyebrow perked and Yang has a brief, uneasy look on her face before congratulating her sister and giving her a hug. The last scene of the initiation arc is somewhat unchanged from before, with Roman planning the next stage of his heist back at his hideout. Though the significant tweak is that he notes that the cops are closing in on their operation. He figures they're going to need a distraction, something to throw the cops off their trail, and he casually thumbs through a news article about the Vital Festival and its financing coming from around the globe. When he gets to the next page, he sees an article about the White Fang, which prompts him to pause before smiling. Episode 7 rolls around and we get the first day of classes, though things do not go pleasantly for Team Ruby. We can see that Ruby is the only one really enthused about rearranging the room. Yang wants to be excited, but was out celebrating late into the night and is thus tired and hungover. Blake seems to be attempting enthusiasm, but is so unused to normal social interaction that she's anxious to be all that vocal about it. And Weiss is decidedly uninterested since she's normally used to having servants do all that sort of work for her. Ruby manages to cajole them into doing the work, since they needed to get it done anyway, and everyone gets to work. After they rearrange the room, with some minor squabbles popping up between what denotes personal space, and the fact that Ruby shears the curtain in two, the room is eventually finished just in time for them to realize they're late for class. We see a montage of some of the different classes they're attending for the semester. Hunter Regulation and Law, which Ruby and Yang both sleep through, Sparring and Team Building, which Ruby goofs off in, Grim Studies, which Ruby doodles in, and finally Dust Application. It's in this class that Weiss's patience with Ruby and her teammates is tested. Ruby tries to be funny, doing some sort of visual gag. I had the idea for using Dust Crystals to imitate Port, but I'm not too sure how that would fly. And for a brief moment, she manages to get Weiss to chuckle. It just so happens though that Weiss chuckling causes her to tip a vial of potent dust they were working with and ends up blowing up the whole dust slab with a concussive blast. Shocked, dirty, and with her ears still ringing, Weiss shakes, growls, and shouts Ruby's name. Ruby says, uh, oops, and we swipe to Osbin's office. The scene opens with them being reprimanded for their poor behavior and for blowing up the dust lab in only their first day. Ozpin, being rather wise and manipulative, notes that the intention of this somewhat randomized partner and team selection process was developed in order to force individual hunters to learn to work with and against their own faults, not only as combatants but also as people. Learning to cooperate and work together is one of the greatest assets humanity has in the face of the Grim, and while hunting alone is typical procedure, working together with other hunters, civilians, and military personnel is frequent enough for cooperation and coordination to become a necessary asset in the hunter's toolset. As such, recognizing problem students when he sees them, he has decided to assign them some guidance, a team one year their senior to help them work out the kinks in their dynamics, who they'll meet the following day. In addition, they're assigned to some community service in order to account for the damages to the school. Weiss offers to pay, of course, but Osman chuckles and says that it's not a monetary issue he's concerned with, but rather an issue of attitude. As Ruby shuffles out the door, Ruby stays behind to ask his advice and he gives the same speech, or at least similar rendition of the I've made many mistakes speech in order to put her worries at bay. Episode 8 begins the next day, and the four discuss what happened over lunch, with Weiss raising issue with most members of the team, especially Ruby. Yang and Ruby defend themselves, of course, but even though Ruby sticks up for Yang and her lackadaisical nature, Yang is slow to defend Ruby, showing some apparent unease with her sister. Blake is quiet, except for a brief moment when she notices Velvet at another table being bullied by Cardin. She clenches her fist and snarls, but Weiss brings her back to the conversation, finally addressing her issues with Blake, which, compared to Ruby and Yang, are minor at worst. Blake shakes her head and leaves the table, ending the conversation. The next scene introduces us to their older siblings for the year, Team Coffee, with Coco making a very defined, aggressive entrance in the same vein as a drill sergeant. Coco praises them introducing herself and her team, keeping on the drill sergeant act the whole way through. She explains that they're here to kick all of them into shape and get them functioning like a proper unit, saying that Ozpin's giving her power to punish all of them if they don't listen. When Weiss tries to speak up, Coco makes her do push-ups. Fox leans in and whispers to Coco that he didn't quite think this is what Ozpin had in mind and that Ozpin didn't give them any power to punish Ruby. Coco finally relents, acknowledging to just be messing with Ruby from the get-go. 
She defers to Fox, who suggests that the eight of them split off into pairs in order for Coffee to get a feel for each person's individual issues. He explains that anything they want to talk about is privileged knowledge, and that the school will expel any member of Team Coffee that talks about anything discussed between sibling pairs. Ruby, of course, splits off with Coco, Weiss goes with Fox, Blake with Velvet, and Yang with Yatsuhashi. We cut to each conversation and get a different insight on each of the characters involved. Starting with Ruby and Coco, the two go to Coffee's dorm room where Coco uses fashion to frame Ruby's issues. Coco, though a bit dry, is good-natured and jokes with Ruby, which eases the mood. Coco directs the conversation to how Ruby is approaching being a leader for her team, to which Ruby responds that she was planning to take up a more firm leadership role whenever the group was on a mission. Coco chastises her, explaining that being a leader is a round-the-clock duty, no matter the circumstances. Wanting to have fun and be a good-natured goof is all well and good, but Ruby needs to keep in mind that she's constantly wearing the team leader hat, and thus any outfit she wears, a metaphor for Ruby's actions, needs to match that hat, no matter the circumstances. We then jump to Yang and Yatsuhashi who are at the gym. Yatsu meditates while Yang does push-ups and talks. Yang is far more open about her issues and is actually quite thankful to have someone to talk to about them. She expresses her unease with her sister, both as a teammate and as a leader. She's proud of Ruby, but also wants her sister to stop depending on her so much. She also admits that she needs Ruby to be strong because she's afraid that one day she'll leave Ruby all alone without anyone to back her up which gives us an early indication that Yang not only fears becoming like Raven, but also acknowledges that despite that fear, she may very well abandon Ruby. Yatsuhashi doesn't utter a peep during this, as Yang uses him mostly as a sounding board for her issues. It's only after touching on her own faults that he raises some questions, challenging Yang to question her behavior towards her sister and the rest of the team. People, not just a good leader, need someone they can rely on and keep them moving forward. By fearing some eventuality that may never occur, all she has done is set a self-fulfilling prophecy in place that is distancing her from her sister. Yang makes a remark about Blake being distant, and Yatsu says that partners need to trust each other as well, and that she and Blake will bond so long as she's there to support her partner when she needs it. Rice is a slightly different story than the others. She and Fox sit down at the bench, with Fox trying to open a dialogue by way of asking what her problem is. Instead, Weiss reiterates a condensed version of her gripes with her teammates. Ruby is too stupid, Yang is too lazy, Blake is too quiet, and tops it off with how, if she were in charge, she'd have them all whipped into shape by now. Fox attempts to speak again, only for Weiss to cut him off, saying that he couldn't possibly understand since he wasn't a leader. The conversation ends with the both awkwardly sitting in silence. Blake and the Velvet are the last two shown in the episode. Velvet takes Blake through Beacon's gardens, tending to a few of the flowers as she goes. After some small chit-chat, Blake finally asks how Velvet does it, why she puts up with being bullied by Cardin when she's a year older. Velvet is somewhat embarrassed, one of her juniors saw that, but explains that Cardin might be a bully, but that an eye for an eye would make the whole world blind. Hurting him would only make him more resentful of the Faunus, and as such, she's going to let him get his frustrations out on someone who can take it, while she tries to figure out a way to maybe befriend him so he'll stop bullying altogether. That doesn't mean she'll put herself in position to be bullied, but she knows her limits. Even if it's painful, she can deal with him. She'd much rather gain friends than enemies anyway, and just looks as Cardin as an extra challenge in that regard. At sunset, the groups converge again and go their separate ways, with Ruby leaving the courtyard. Coffee converses about the people they were paired off with in vague terms. Coco remarks that Ruby is young and inexperienced, but she picked up on what Coco said very quickly. Yatsu remarks that Yang equally has a good head on her shoulders, while Velvet was delighted with her conversation with Blake, even if Blake didn't open up at all. Fox, meanwhile, laments that he couldn't get a peep out of Weiss. Coco pats his shoulder, saying that with what she saw with Ruby, she has faith Weiss's shell will come off one day. Episode 9 begins with Team Ruby and Vale doing community service, with most of them complaining about how two weeks of punishment for one screw-up is too harsh and how relieved they are this is their last day of it. Velvet is there to oversee them as they clean after a normal festival, with many of them remarking that this much cleanup will be nothing compared to the cleanup needed after the Vital Festival coming up in a few months. Ruby is using her semblance to create an airstream that sucks all of the trash into ready cans held by Yang and Blake, and Yang compliments her on using it so creatively. She also helps Blake out when she struggles to hold down her own can against the Windy Blasts. Out of all of Team Ruby, Weiss is the only one not doing any of the work, finding clean garbage to be below her station. Ruby tries to chew her out for it, but falters in her confidence. 
Yang backs her up just a bit, noting that it would go quicker and easier if Weiss helped Blake hold her can so they didn't constantly have to readjust it after every one of Ruby's bursts. Velvet steps in and suggests that Weiss help some of the other workers down at the stands instead since it'll be cleaner, and Weiss reluctantly complies since the whole team would get in trouble otherwise. A few of the workers are excited to work with a Schnee and openly call for her to join them, noting that they'd be better company than a critter like Velvet. Vel frowns at the epitaph, and Blake flinches angrily. Velvet shares a look with Blake, shaking her head that it isn't worth it. Yang asks what that was all about, and Blake is quiet for a moment before entrusting to Yang alone, as a half-truth, that she used to be a Faunus ally and language like that riles her up. Yang notes the irony of being on a team with Weiss after hearing that, but otherwise sympathizes with Blake, earning a small appreciative smile. The remaining three members of Ruby get back to work, and then their next wave of trash accidentally come across a person they gotten swept up in it. They pull the girl out who is revealed to be Penny. Introductions go as normal, and she explains that she was curious why the area was roped off, which is why she wandered into Ruby's path. There's a brief conversation with Penny when Weiss wanders back over, brushing herself off after some scaffolding collapsed. She snarls at the workers, calling them ruffians and klutzes worse than Ruby. She takes notice of Penny, and further introductions are made. Penny offers to help them clean and proves herself incredibly able, holding two bins by herself and doubling their cleaning efforts. However, in her enthusiasm to help, she accidentally covers Weiss in trash, angering the heiress and prompting Ruby to defend her new friend. Weiss, pissed, says she's done for the day and goes towards the heliport. Ruby apologizes for Weiss's rudeness, and Penny says it's okay before parting ways with the team. Velvet, seeing the progress the girls made, calls it a day for them and congratulates them on finishing their community service. However, as the four head back to the helipad, they come across another death shop that was robbed. The Atlantic girls listen in to the police, who theorize it was most likely the White Fang like the last two robberies they've had. The next episode begins with Team Ruby going to Spartan class, though Weiss apparently went ahead for some reason. The three talk, and Blake thanks Ruby for her pointers when it comes to tuning Gamble Shroud, and Yang thanks her for saving her ass on the first test in Grimm Studies, which goes a ways towards showing both that Ruby is improving a bit as a leader and as a friend. As they approach the class, we learn why Weiss went ahead, with the other three members accidentally eavesdropping on her and Glinda discussing the possibility of switching teams or having the leader be reassigned. While Weiss is adamant about getting a transfer, Glinda rebuffs her, defending Ospin's judgment on the decision, quoting that hundreds of huntsmen have graduated from Beacon, and that the only times transfers were ever necessary were if for some reason one of the teammates could not complete the year. This puts a bad taste in everyone's mouth going into the class, and none of it is helped when Glinda announces that it's time to spar partners. Weiss refuses, citing Ruby as unworthy of her talents. Ruby is taken aback. She knew that Weiss didn't think much of her as a leader, but as a fighter, Ruby has a definitive sense of pride in her skill, something she thought that Weiss had picked up on being partners. Glinda, uneasy about the tension, allows the fight, emphasizing the rules in an attempt to keep things from getting out of hand, which allows the audience to understand both more about the nitty-gritty of Aura and about the mechanics of combat matches in the universe. Could even have some witty dialogue here, like Weiss being like, I know the rules, Professor, and Glinda being like, Rules change when the stakes are personal, Miss Schnee. It is too bad then that the rules do not stay changed when all is said and done. Ruby and Weiss duel, and it's an exceptional fight, with both of them going all out on each other, beating each other to an absolute pulp, and it ends on a very, very close win for Weiss. However, Weiss doesn't see the win for the hair's breadth away she was from loss, and instead lords it over Ruby as a sign of Ruby's incompetence. All Ruby can do is growl as Yang and Blake pick her up and dust her off. As Weiss walks into the shadows of the arena, we have a smooth transition to Torchwick scrambling out of the shadows, clearly injured and carrying a briefcase much like the one from Episode 1. He's being chased by a hunter, one who has clearly injured him. Torchwick uses a good amount of guile and trickery to delay the Huntsman, injuring the man significantly but ultimately is cornered at which point the Huntsman strikes. But instead of dying, Torchwick shatters into glass. The Huntsman is then impaled from behind by a sharp blade, killing him. Off to the side is Torchwick, watching Neo pull her blade from the man's back and screw it into her parasol. She coughs, and Torchwick is at her side, guiding her towards a van, commenting that while he's grateful for the save, she really should stay in bed. He needs her alive and well to pull off the biggest heist yet. 
Episode 11 is now the official beginning point of the Jean arc, though by now we've spent considerably more time with Ruby as a team to justify this, 90 minutes compared to the original show's 60. Technically speaking, this arc has been roughly doubled in size from 20 minutes to 40, but this also doesn't accurately reflect the involvement Ruby will play in things coming forward, which lowers that number back down to roughly 20 minutes of focus across a 4 episode span. A few days have passed from the duel between Ruby and Weiss, which is the topic of the day between Juniper, Blake, and Yang. Apparently, the relationship between the two, and indeed Weiss and the rest of the team, has bottomed out, leading Ruby to drown herself in video games and Weiss to bury herself in her studies in order to avoid interacting with each other. John makes some kind of remark about the duel itself, either innocuous or sarcastic, and Yang responds by pointing out how in their partner's spar, Piero won in under 30 seconds. We even get to see a brief clip of the fight to demonstrate the monumental difference in skill. Pira, being kindly and having the first inklings of her being smitten with John, tries to defend him but John rebuffs everyone, claiming that he was just off his game for the day. Calling his bluff, Yang and Nora dare John to challenge Cardin on the next sparring day. He accepts and Pira asks if that's really a wise decision, to which he responds that he's not afraid. Wipe cut to John in the arena across from Cardin, double guessing his course of action. We see a more extensive rendition of the fight between the two, with inklings of John's tactical nature showing through in order to keep him afloat, but it's apparent that Cardin's raw skill and strength outmatch him by miles. Summarily defeated, John goes off to tend to his injured pride. Pira, of course, drags him off to the roof, and this is where she offers to help him. He takes offense and finally admits that in order to pursue his family name and tradition, he forged transcripts and got his way into Beacon. He defends himself, pointing out that he's genuinely been trying to catch up, a fact that we've seen as a background detail in a number of previous episodes, and that he doesn't need any help to get better. Pira, disheartened and unwanted, leaves. With John alone on the roof, Cardin reveals that this touching moment happens right above his room, and begins to extort John with the newly revealed truth. Episode 12 focuses on the fallout of Cardin finding out John's secret, with John run ragged during his classes. He's even so tired that when called upon by Ublek in history class, he gives the asinine answer about binoculars. Of course, none of his friends know what's going on, and the audience only have an inkling of what's caused the previously attentive John to suddenly become lackluster in class, and it only comes to light for the audience when Cardin pulls him aside and casually orders John to do the homework for tomorrow for all of Team Cardinal. His friends show concern during lunch, but he shrugs them off, heading back to the dorm in order to get started on the obscene workload that he has ahead of him. Yang voices her concern to Pira, who is also uneasy and equally confused, but feels too polite to pry. Yang huffs in frustration that it hasn't even been a single semester and their friends group is already going through a massive bout of drama. Sick of it, she states the intent to bring them all close together personally, a notion that Pira counters by saying getting involved would just complicate the drama. Yang brushes off the assertion and tries to get Blake's solidarity on the issue, only for Blake to be distracted, watching Cardin torture Velvet. Catching this, Yang and Pira both agree that people like Cardin are trash, and there's nothing any of them can really do. Nora, of course, suggests breaking his legs, but Yang and Pira note that it would get them suspended if not expelled. Blake, however, bites back, asking why stopping bullying would be a bad thing. To everyone's surprise, Weiss walks up to the lunch table and weighs in, noting her own bafflement that Faunus are even allowed to attend Beacon in the first place. Some more vaguely racist remarks from Weiss and some barbs between her, Blake, and Yang later, and tensions at the table have risen. This tension is capped when Ruby arrives with her own lunch. She and Weiss have a momentary glare off before Weiss huffs and goes to find more suitable company. Ruby sits with them, though only pecks at her food, saying she heard Glinda was looking into a possible transfer. While Yang thought that this news might make Ruby happy, Ruby laments that when they worked together in the forest she felt a connection with Weiss, like they really could work well together. As much as they had been at each other's throats, Ruby got the feeling that there was more to Weiss and she was hopeful that there might be a breakthrough eventually. She doesn't give anyone time to respond and says she's not hungry, going off to finish the next level of one of her games. Before she leaves, she confirms with Blake that the two of them are going to go shopping the following day for the Forever Fall class trip. The scene ends with Yang inviting Blake and the latter some of Juniper out for a party since it's Friday, to take some of the edge off. All of them decline, well, Ren turns down for Nora, and Yang remarks it's their loss and goes out to get ready for a night partying and boozing. Episode 13 unfolds in Vale with Ruby and Blake shopping for camping supplies. They're heading for an expedition to Fairer Fall, and their grades in the survival class end up dictating their budget for supplies in order to teach them the importance of learning and success in the profession, leaving the struggling team Ruby quite strapped for cash. 
For all the stress being put on them though, the two are in oddly high spirits, able to bond over a number of different book series that they talk about while they shop for camping equipment at a local store. Blake is even surprised when Ruby mentions some of her choices, as they convey much darker themes than Ruby initially seemed to be able to handle, which calls back to her life isn't like a fairy tale line. Ruby goes a bit deeper into her own musings on the subject. She loves old stories, but when she looked them up herself, she often found the originals and not the modern versions taught to kids, which opened her eyes to how scary the world can be. However, she looked to how each story was pacified for younger audiences and found an underlying truth in how something fun and enjoyable can be born from something more twisted. She looks at the world as something that is plagued by monsters, and people like Huntsman are the force that will slowly change that reality into a more fun and friendly one. Admittedly, she doesn't articulate this quite as well, as she's still not 100% able to comprehend her own thought process, but Blake learns to respect the surprising amount of maturity Ruby has. She challenges Ruby, asking if Weiss being so difficult to work with is analogous to her musings, and Ruby admits that she never really thought the process would ever necessarily be easy. And to contribute to that, Weiss is really just the first indication that this is the kind of world she'll be having to work within in order to change it in the first place. Meanwhile, a hungover Yang is slapped awake by Coco, who shides her for even getting drunk when the rest of her team was already in disarray. As she explains, her and Velvet found the blonde in a gutter while out on a morning jog and dragged her back to their room. Yang feebly tries to shove Coco and the rest of Team Coffee away, but is too impaired to be effective. Yang laments that there's nothing she can do and that she took Pyrrha's words to heart. Getting involved would just spur on more drama, so she tried to drown her woes and booze and hope it goes away, something she picked up on from her uncle. Yatsuhashi is about to say something when Koko slaps her again, berating her that, sure, jumping in at the wrong moment will just make things more messy, but jumping in at the precise right moment she needs to can go miles towards solving an issue. There's some more bickering back and forth between the two before Yang decides to go to sleep on the advice in her dorm. Back shopping, Blake and Ruby split up, only for Ruby to run into Penny, who happily joins in on the equipment hunt. Along the way, they find Pira, doing much the same, but who is also worriedly looking for John, who she lost while shopping downtown. Flip over to Blake, where she runs into John. The boy is looking for rapier wasps like Horton demanded he do. Looking at Blake and recalling her stealthy nature, paired possibly with some good comedic clips of her doing her best ninja impressions, John strikes up a plan and pulls her aside, asking for her help with something sensitive. Blake is resistant until he mentions getting back at Cardin and getting him off his back. With a grudge against the bully, Blake ends the episode asking what John needed her to do. Episode 14 comes the exciting conclusion to the John arc, with all the teams camping in Forever Fall for Professor Peach's survival course. Glinda, one of the other chaperones, explains the day's assignments of gathering sap and leaves the teams to do the work. She pulls Weiss and Ruby aside and explains that while they are making unusual preparations to swap teams, the two are still partners for the interim and should work together as amicably as possible. Ruby takes the suggestion seriously, and when Weiss makes a dry quip about Ruby, Ruby manages to stomach it peacefully. Ruby asks Weiss to take the lead, since she doesn't want to cause friction. Weiss haughtily accepts the suggestion and begins doling out instructions while Blake and Yang watch. Later in the episode, though, we see inklings of friendship between the two, moments where Weiss lets her guard down that are brief background details that astute viewers might be able to pick up on. We cut the Team Cardinal, who are lounging around while John does all the work. However, John only comes back with a few filled jars, enough for him and his own team, but not for Cardinal. Cardin is of course livid, but John attempts to stand up to him. However, before he can hit Cardin with the trump card that he's been building up, he's dragged out to fulfill Cardin's master plan, coating Pyrrha in sap and unleashing the wasps on her. However, John turns on him, coating him in sap instead. Enraged, Cardin and his team beat John, only to be interrupted when an Ursa, attracted by the sap, arrives. All but Cardin and John scatter, with Cardin trying to fend off the beast only to lose his mace over a cliffside. Russell, knowing Blake saved him at the initiation, begs Blake and her team to go save Cardin. Blake is visibly tempted to refuse, but decides to help when she hears John screaming as well. She calls her Ruby, Weiss, Yang, and Pira, who all rush to help. Nora by this point is unconscious from eating too much sap and has passed out, leaving Ren to make sure she's safe. Ruby quickly assesses the situation and puts Blake, Yang, and Pira on guard at the perimeter of the clearing, which Weiss objects to, saying they should just rush it at the same time. Ruby snaps back at Weiss, having slipped into full leader mode and telling the girl just to do as she says. As this is going on, Cardin uses a jar of sap to try and attack the Ursa. Sadly, all he succeeds in doing is covering it in goo. However, this prompts John to grab his own jar and opens it in order to lure the Grim away from Cardin. 
Ruby explains that she's going to knock the bear off the cliff, and she needs a boost from one of Weiss's glyphs in order to give her the extra ump for the kick. All they need is an opening. Both John and Peter hear this, and John immediately sprints for the cliff, acting as bait. The Ursa goes for him and gives them that opening. Ruby launches forward, and John barely manages to dodge out of the way, with Peter demonstrating her semblance by dragging him a few extra inches to safety. Instead of Ruby seeing this happen, it's Yang that asks about her semblance, and we get to the fact that it's polarity. With the Ursa push off the cliff, Weiss chews Ruby out for her plan, but Ruby stands up for herself and defends her actions. It wasn't Ursa Major that attacked, which are primarily solo hunters, but if she were wrong, and it was just a normal Ursa, then they would have to worry about a whole pack of them showing up later, in which case their strongest fighters were right there to hold the line. In addition, since she called it that it was a Major, none of their weapons would be able to pierce its hide, meaning the only way to deal with it would be to knock it off a cliff instead. Weiss is dumbfounded by Ruby's cunning, but more infuriated at being talked down to, so she stomps off. John helps Carden up and finally pops his trump card. He had a friend, heavily implied to be Blake, sneak in and swap out Carden's transcripts with forged replicas that John made from the originals, meaning John technically has the same blackmail wage over Carden's head as he has himself. They come to a mutual agreement to drop the blackmail and call it even, though animosity clearly still lingers between the two. The last scene is John on the rooftop with Pira accepting her offer to train him. Jumping to episode 15, a few days have passed. The crew while at lunch remark how Juniper has started to really show improvement quite quickly, though they note that Carden has been more aggressive lately in how he treats people around him. Even his team looks bedraggled. It should be noted here that Weiss has been eating at a different table, alone ever since their last cafeteria encounter, and is a minor point of conversation. Regardless, this whole dialogue is punctuated with Carden bullying Velvet, this time far rougher and more viciously than before. Blake, finally reaching a breaking point, begs John to use his leverage to help Velvet. John regretfully replies that he can't, that his and Cardinal's mutual failure policy is too fragile to exploit, especially so soon after it was developed. Velvet isn't technically one of John's friends, and if he were to start including people as his friends with abandon, Carden would almost likely snap and get them both thrown out. Blake is infuriated by this and decides to stand up to Carden herself, getting Velvet out of his hands and back to the safety of their friends group. Blake and Carden get into a screaming match, with Blake calling him out on his emasculation in light of the Ursa. Carden shoots back that if he's so weak, what right does a furball like Velvet, who doesn't even fight back, have to even be in a school like Beacon? Blake shoots back with more of a right than you, and this little back and forth continues until Weiss steps in, defending Carden's argument. While she makes it quite clear that his behavior is boorish, the fact that Velvet didn't stand up to him was a clear indication of the natural subservience Faunus had in relation to humans, a belief she remarks is quite well known in Atlas. It's simply childish, misguided thought that anyone would put Faunus on the same footing with typical humans, which is why activists like the White Fang quickly devolved into tantrum-throwing babies that needed to use violence to get things done. Blake at this point is stunned speechless by the arrogant and pointedly racist comments. Yang stands up besides Blake and calls White out on her comments, to which Weiss rebuffs Yang as a simpleton for not understanding such nuanced positions. Ruby at this point speeds out the door, and Pira joins in the argument, commenting that Weiss's position isn't nuanced, it's overly simplistic, and it's these words from someone we know that Weiss has respect for that snaps a few things free in Weiss's head and gives her pause. However, Carton decides to pick things up for her and argues back that Weiss knows what she's talking about, especially since she's arguably one of the most intelligent people in their class, and threatens to attack Pira if she insults either one of them again. John steps in and finally pulls rank on Carden, which causes Carden to threaten him back that he can't protect his friends forever. Which, you know, is foreshadowing. This is where Coco bursts into the cafeteria, the rest of Team Coffee behind her, saying that John won't have to protect them so long as Team Coffee is around. Ruby walks around the group, out of breath, having run off to fetch them the minute things started really getting heated. Carden, being prompted to stand down by the Craven Russell, finally acknowledges that he's outmatched, tells everyone to go screw themselves, and storms off, not to be seen for the rest of the season. Things are still tense though, what with Weiss's true opinions of the Faunus being outed, and her and Blake quickly launch into another heated argument over the topic. We can even have that similar jump cut like in the original rendition of this fight. This of course leads to Weiss talking about the family that she's lost to the White Fang, and the pain caused to her that she has ended up attributing to all Faunus kind. She mentions the White Fang, Blake shouts that we were just sick of being pushed around, and before anyone has time to really digest what Blake yelled, she sprints from the room. Everyone watches her go, but all of them are too shocked to follow. The episode ends with Blake at the edge of Beacon's Terrace, taking off her bow and looking behind her at the school's spires before running off into the distance.
Episode 16 picks up shortly thereafter, with the three remaining members of Ruby arguing about Blake, with Yang and Ruby immediately wanting to go after her and Weiss demanding they report her to the school for being a terrorist. They all try to challenge one another's points. If Blake were still White Fang, wouldn't she have struck Weiss by now? Wouldn't she have avoided blowing her cover? Weiss counters by saying that perhaps it was a Long Kong to get closer to her family, invoking an uncle that was killed in a very familiar fashion by his wife's favorite servant. Yang retorts by arguing that they shouldn't even have servants, and Weiss shouts back that their servants are all paid a healthy wage, way more than they should considering her family's history with the Faunus. Meanwhile, Blake is wandering the town and stumbles into Penny, who seems to be assisting with more clean efforts to prepare for the first stage of the Vital Festival. Blake finds it weird, but Penny mentions that she enjoyed it so much that she decided to take it up as a part-time job, especially since her father wanted her to get out and socialize more, though she questions if she's properly interpreting what her father meant. Regardless, she asks if Ruby and Yang are also around, as she always has a good time when Team Ruby is together, and Blake just shakes her head no and excuses herself. Penny happily waves her off and tells her not to be a stranger, though when Blake is out of earshot, Penny realizes that no one actually knows where she lives. Blake arrives at a bookstore, and when she goes inside, we meet Tuxin and learn that the two know each other from their shared history with the White Fang. He's surprised to see her, and even alarmed that she apparently quit Beacon, but he nonetheless offers his guest room to her, which she is grateful to take. Back at the Ruby dorm room, Yang has had enough of Weiss's BS and has decided to set out and search for Blake. Ruby agrees to join her in a bit, but that Yang should go and get a head start. Ruby stays behind and pleads Weiss to hear Blake's side of the story. Weiss disregards her and says that she's taking the issue straight to Ospin. The last statement she makes is that by the end of tomorrow, Team Ruby would be completely dismantled. In episode 17, Blake is arranging books to assist Tuxin as one of his sales associates, a small way for her to repay his kindness. While working, though, she overhears a few of the Faunus customers saying someone is offering illicit work for something big and that the White Fang is going to take the fall. Blake is of course alarmed by this, but ultimately turns away. Cut to Weiss, who works her way up to Osmond's office and confronts him about Blake, her assumed history at the White Fang, and Ruby's incompetence as a leader. Ospin being Ospin, though, flips the conversation on her, pointing out how he's been following Team Ruby's exploits and drama rather closely considering how much of an issue their team has been for poor Glinda. He explained that what he saw during initiation more than impressed him and that Ruby showed talent under her more childish assets, and that despite still carrying much of that childish niche with her, she is rapidly shedding it to become a healthy leader. Or at least she would be, were it not for a certain heiress causing friction within the realms of her team. In addition, he's observed how amicable Blake has been if she's indeed a former White Fang member, and how he has personally looked into every student before they attend. If you find something disagreeable with the protection of humanity, he would never permit it to enter beyond the front door, inquiring if Weiss still thinks he made a mistake. She of course says no, but he still gives her a stern suggestion to meditate on what it means to be part of a team, especially when she isn't the one in command of it. Otherwise, the only mistake he made would be admitting her to the academy in the first place. Effectively, this talk functions like the port talk, but with an extra layer of ice water to the face for Weiss, as now her haughty behavior has consequences that go beyond alienating her peers group. Or at the very least, she perceives it that way, since Ozpin never directly threatens to kick her out. Meanwhile, Ruby is downtown looking for Blake. We see that she and Yang are coordinating by scroll, but neither are having much luck, even though they've been searching for about a day. She then gets a message from Coco, stating she knows Ruby's in the city, and asks her to come have a drink. The question is more of a demand, and Ruby reluctantly agrees. Coco is sitting at a cafe, but offers to walk with Ruby so we can avoid any actual cafe scenes. Lord knows I've already peppered the whole of this reconstruction with enough of those. Coco opens up at reflecting on her history with Fox. Her previous partner died during initiation, and Fox's partner was too injured to continue a career in hunting, so the two were stuck together at the end of things and put on Team Coffee. Coco started out as a showboat and Fox was a loose cannon, and they were constantly trying to one-up each other, eventually ending with Velvet and Yatsuhashi sitting them down and forcing them to actually work together. It still didn't work, but going through enough turbulent fights together helped them forge an understanding. It took time, but by the end of the year, Coffee was starting to gain ground where other teams were failing. Her point, she says, is that it takes time for a team to acclimate, and even with the improvements Ruby is making as a leader, sometimes it's not her fault things aren't going as planned. All she can do is try to roll with the blows until things come together. Of course, she adds, this doesn't mean Ruby can slack off and blame everything on everyone else. She should always strive to improve herself. Ruby says that doesn't really help her find Blake, to which Coco replies that she's not worried about Blake. From what Velvet says, Blake has a good head on her shoulders, it's just not quite properly aligned yet. And when it is, she'll come back to the home Ruby and Yang have helped build for her. 
Ruby then points out that none of that really applies to her situation. Coco admits she knows it doesn't really apply, but that she's obligated to at least attempt giving Ruby advice because she blew last year's dance budget on clothes for her and her team. Ruby just says, oh, okay, and the scene peters out awkwardly. The last scene is of Blake in the bookstore closing up for the night and letting her ears out of her bow, when an unseen figure walks up behind her. She says they're closed, and the stranger says, I knew you would look better without the bow, prompting Blake to spin around in surprise. Yang is standing there, looking exhausted but smiling. Episode 18 begins with Yang sending a message off to Ruby, telling Blake that all she did was make sure Ruby knew they were both safe. She didn't tell Ruby where they were or anything beyond that. Blake thanks her for being discreet, and Yang shrugs it off, casually replying it's the right thing to do. Analyzing what Yang said at the end of the prior episode, Blake asks if Yang knew about her ears and how. Yang answers frankly that she had her suspicions and noticed a number of things about Blake since they've been paired up that tipped her off, but figured that Blake would tell them all the truth whenever she felt the most comfortable, once again showing that Yang is a rather observant and considerate kind of person. Yang finally gets to the heart of the matter, asking Blake about her past though definitely leaving an exit for Blake to take any time she felt uncomfortable. Blake gives the same speech she gave Sun at the end of Volume 1 to Yang, who is not a Faunus and hasn't been able to see the politics of the White Fang from a Faunus point of view, so the exposition here works far smoother than it did previously. Not to mention, it's noted here that Blake got involved young and had a normal life that she could have lived, but abandoned it in pursuit of equal rights. She goes on to explain that after their first leader stepped down, someone she'd seemed to hold in very high regard, the new leader became more aggressive in his tactics, and even turned a blind eye to crimes being perpetrated by lower level protesters. And she even heard rumors of him condoning the actions as well. She left the White Fang because of this corruption, but also because she saw what it did to someone she used to consider a dearly close friend, a relationship with possible romantic implications that turned incredibly sour at the end. After she left, she enlisted Tuxin's help, a sympathizer with the White Fang, though an objector to their actions. He shares Blake's disgust for the criminal elements of the White Fang and understood it was probably healthier if he helped those wishing to leave the organization than stay with it himself. Yang is quiet through all of this, carefully listening and absorbing what she's being told. At the end of Blake's little soliloquy, Yang asks the obvious question. Why didn't she tell the team or even just Yang? Blake responds that she already got burned by someone she trusted once and wasn't looking for any deep relations at Beacon. She'd spent so much time outside the kingdoms that it was rare for her to come across hunters that traveled in groups, with lone wolf hunters having more frequent encounter rate. So her natural assumption was that most hunters operate alone. It was only during initiation that she really began to realize that she'd have to be stuck with someone for the next four years, and she was caught between her injured heart wanting to connect with someone and her sense of logic telling her that she needed to remain detached, thus explaining her almost bipolar investment in the team. Yang just smiles though, and says that when you're friends with her, you're friends for life, even if you never see each other again. It's not the distance that matters, it's the connection, which is a sentence that triggers some form of melancholy for herself. We jump over to the Ruby who's just receiving Yang's message and is heading back to her dorm. Before she can get into the dorm, however, she overhears Weiss approaching Pyrrha to talk about something. We cut closer to Weiss's perspective and see that Pyrrha isn't too happy with the way Weiss handled herself in the argument the other day, especially with her racist mindset barred to the world. Weiss, however, pleads a listening ear and Pyrrha relents since she's too inclined to be nice even when she thinks someone is wrong. The two go up to the roof and Ruby follows along, eavesdropping. Weiss admits that she's more than confused about everything happening around her and her team. Back in Atlas, everyone would kowtow to her will, the only people that wouldn't were her own family, and she left specifically to break free of them. But now she's finding it harder and harder to connect with anyone, and with even the headmaster of Beacon glaring over his glasses at her, she feels sick to her stomach with anxiety. She came to Beacon to be free, but feels more suffocated than ever, and Pyrrha is the only person she knows who might be able to understand since the Mistrillian is her own form of celebrity royalty. Peter pulls pieces from what Weiss is saying in order to help Weiss sort through it, and even manages to relate with some of that grief. There was a point where she only saw the people around her as there for her, as servants, but after an accident that Peter was responsible for, some sense got knocked into her head that these were still people around her. She tried to take responsibility for the accident, but the PR team covered it up, even if she and the family of the injured party knew what really happened. She advises Weiss to look at people as her equals before anything else. Human, faunus, it doesn't really matter. If she wants to fix this mess between her and her team, she needs to humble herself just a bit. She could be as skilled and as well-trained as she wanted to. No one wants to work with, let alone talk to, someone who was pompous and ungrateful. Pyrrha looks to the entranceway to the roof, knowingly, having been aware of Ruby's presence the entire time. 
She tells Weiss that maybe the first thing she needed to do in order to get on that path was to learn how to apologize. She nods to Ruby, who has decided to walk out onto the roof. Peter smiles and leaves the two alone, saying that Ren was planning to make Nora some pancakes and she wasn't going to miss out. Ruby and Weiss are left standing awkwardly on the roof. Episodes 19 and 20 are effectively just one long episode, so their summary kind of gets smushed together, sort of like I did back with the initiation arc. Regardless, we're at the finale. The episode opens with Torchwick and Neo overseeing a small fleet of bullheads all lined up inside of an aviation warehouse. He turns to a collection of White Fang disguised thieves and orders them to move out. Roman thumbs through a pamphlet of the Vital Festival with images of priceless art on it, with Roman even making a snide remark about how big a fan he is of the classics. We snap back to Ruby and Weiss who are still staring awkwardly at each other. Ruby says they should probably sit down and Weiss, seemingly drained, agrees. The two slowly, almost painfully apologize to one another. Weiss for being so unruly and disrespectful, and Ruby for being so childish. Ruby admits that it's hard being a good leader, and Weiss adds self-deprecatingly that it doesn't help when the people under you don't listen. After sharing some kinder words, the two stand and Ruby declares that they're going to sweep all this under the rug and start from scratch. Ruby reintroduces herself to Weiss, properly this time with a handshake, and says both confidently and invitingly that she'll be Weiss's partner and team leader for the next four years, and she looks forward to having Weiss at her side. Weiss cracks a smile and reintroduces herself properly as well, making the bold statement that she'll be the best partner Ruby will ever have. Of course, Ruby playfully challenges that comment, and Weiss plays along, earning the first genuine, unfettered laugh between the two in the series. Of course, then Weiss asks about Blake, though it's clear that even with this change in character, she's uneasy about Blake's history. Ruby answers that Yang found her, though she went quiet so they could talk things out. Weiss is equal part relieved and on edge. Ruby says that she's confident Yang can handle things and that they'll see the two in the morning. Instead, she says that Pyrrha definitely just invited them to free pancakes, so why not take them up on the offer? Weiss is skeptic about pancakes at night, but Ruby talks her into it. Back at Tuxen's, Blake and Yang are settling in for the night, with Yang taking Tuxen's couch. During some amiable conversation, the White Fang crops up and Blake mentions she's hearing rumors of the White Fang suddenly committing more crimes inside of Vale, which was news that hadn't quite reached Beacon's rumor mill. It probably didn't help she actively avoided anything White Fang related while at school. However, she thought it was all that the White Fang would do any kind of terrorist work while in Vale, since it was arguably one of the most amicable kingdoms towards the Faunus, and wonders if she overheard about them being framed as true. Tuxen joins them and chimes in, not surprised that Blake's heard rumors. Someone is trying to frame the White Fang for their own crimes. Blake, though objecting to the White Fang's methods, knows that these crimes are only going to really affect the public's perception of the Faunus, and the White Fang will only become more violent in return for the damaged reputation. Yen posits the idea of clearing the White Fang's name, and uses the same logic that Sun used at that point to get an inkling as to what to look for. Tuxen makes note that there are priceless Mantellian art pieces being shipped in from the Vital Festival, and we as an audience can key into how precious these pieces are because the censorship of art in Mantle would have been brought up during the history class back in episode 12. Yang and Blake set out to stop the crime, with Yang sending a quick message to Ruby to meet them at the docks where the art is being sent. We briefly cut back to Ruby mid-pancake with Juniper and Weiss, being interrupted by the message. Everyone seems to be having a good time, but her eyes bug out at the message and grabs Weiss before booking it out the door. Nora just shrugs and carries on eating while the other three watch in confusion. When Yang and Blake arrive, they find the dog guards and workers unconscious or dead in the place crawling with White Fang imposters. Blake also sees Torchwick among them, giving them instructions, and in her rage, sneaks over to hold them hostage. She pleads to the Faunus and the crowd of robbers to think about what they're doing to think how badly keeping at this will hurt the image of Faunus to the rest of the world. One or two give pause, but most are unimpressed. Torchwick laughs her off and uses his cane to escape, kickstarting a fight between himself, his men, Blake, and Yang. Yang of course comes in and is just an awesome powerhouse, kicking the living crap out of just about every grunt there is, similar to how she did in the Yellow trailer. During the fight, Torchwick even mentions seeing her at Junior's bar before heading out the door, somewhat amused by the coincidence. During all this, Ruby and Weiss are rushing to back up Yang and Blake using Ruby's semblance, with Ruby even seeing Yang take damage on the team leader readout she has on her scroll. As a nice additional touch, we'll have Blake's status be unavailable because she shut off her scroll so they wouldn't be able to track her. Still, the two are hightailing it and they run into Penny, doing a surprising amount of work by herself. She mentions it's because all the other workers have to sleep, which catches a raised eyebrow from the partners, but they don't have time for pleasantries. They explain the situation to Penny, who comments that she saw Yang earlier that evening and even point her in the direction that Blake had gone, thus explaining in some depth how Yang had managed to track Blake down. 
Penny decides to join them, even when Ruby says it'll be dangerous, to which the ginger replies that she's combat ready. They get going, and as they rush, Penny calls the cops. Cut back, and Blake and Yang have taken out most of the ground forces, leaving Tortric alone. He manages to hold off Blake, but Yang begins proving an issue just as one of his bullheads arrive to deliver Neo. This is the first confrontation between Yang and Neo, and will go a long way towards establishing their rivalry that was never really established in the original Volume 2. But yes, Yang vs. Neo and Blake vs. Tortric with both Beacon Girls seemingly being outclassed by the two criminals at every turn. Torchwick eventually gets the upper hand on Blake so much so that we see her aura flaring, which we know from previous fights means that she's almost out of juice. He fires a shot at her, something we can guess will either gravely injure or kill her, only for it to be blocked by a wall of ice. Blake looks up to find Weiss and Ruby, both out of breath from rushing, standing defensively in front of her. Blake is happy to see Ruby, but confused to see Weiss, who simply says they'll talk when they all get out of this alive. Team Ruby finally comes together in an Avengers-esque shot, and Ruby and Tortrix share a little banter. Yang also mentions how slippery Neo is, and Ruby postulates a plan. She tells Weiss and Blake to go after Neo, or Snow Cone as Yang has nicknamed her, and Yang and herself will handle Torchwick, a strategy that ends with them gaining territory against a criminal duo. That is until the rest of Torchwick's bullhead fleet shows up and begins firing down at the team, to the point that Weiss is having difficult maintaining defensive ice walls. Penny at this point steps into the fight, having seemed hesitant during the entire confrontation. She jumps forward with her swords and blows the ever-living crap out of each bullhead, with several of them crashing into a nearby building. Ruby is about to run off and make sure that people in the building are safe, only for Penny to inform her that it's an abandoned train station and thus there should be no casualties from anyone other than the opposition. Realizing how south the situation is going, Tortric hops on a bullhead with Neo and the two try to take off, only to be shot down and crash into the same train station as the rest. After all the damage, the train station finally collapses in on itself just as the authorities begin to arrive. We see time cut forward a little bit to all four of them getting treated for wounds, and Weiss gives her little I don't care speech, though without the timestamp because it most certainly has been more than 12 hours at this point, and Weiss was never really part of the search. Effectively, Weiss decides to give Blake a shot. There's still thin ice between them, but whatever happened in Blake's past can gladly stay there for all Weiss cares. Ruby cheers that her team is back together, though quickly wonders how they're going to explain all that property damage to the authorities. They're about to ask Penny her opinion, only to notice that she's missing. The last shot we have before cutting away from Team Ruby for the season is of Penny being driven away by her guardian, who shides her for such a ridiculous interpretation of protocol. We cut to Ozpin, sipping coffee and going over the incoming reports about Ruby and the docks, smiling somewhat to himself, only for the smile to drop when he gets a message from Crow about the Queen having pawns. In an after credits scene, we see that Roman and Neo survive the crash along with a few of his henchmen, and are trapped in an underground train tunnel. However, several other people, wearing different, more official-looking White Fang outfits, hold them up. Roman tries to order them around, only for one of his own men to say, those guys aren't ours. It clicks for Roman that these are actual White Fang, and that in a devilishly ironic twist, they've been captured by the terrorist organization. A fact that Roman can't help but laugh at. He ain't even mad. When one of the Fang members suggests killing the imposters along with Torchwick and his crew, a new female voice turns them down, saying they could use them. The screen lingers only so long as a feminine hand captured in flame rises to the foreground, only to snuff it out and fade to black, setting the scene for Season 2. And there we have it. Season 1 of Ruby, ready to ship, with complete storylines and character arcs all intact. You might notice a few key absences, the most prominent being Sun. Even though he was fantastically voiced, consistently written, and technically did contribute to the plot, he was ultimately a superfluous character in the original version, and his role would have been fulfilled by any character that interacted with Blake, hence why I put Yang in that situation in order to facilitate character growth between partners, instead of being two relative strangers. Don't think he's gone completely though, he will show back up in Season 2 for sure. The other big absence, Cinder, is a different story, as her presence in the show didn't add much of anything and only really served as an extended cameo anyway. In fact, her presence robbed Roman of any form of initiative of his own, and giving him a start in the show as the lead villain, with only his own plans, will only serve to elevate Cinder when she absorbs Torchwick and his conglomerate into her own. By making him his own actor from the start, we have a better context to understand the true depths of villainy that Ruby will have to face going forward. He's also a good, ground-level villain for us to begin gauging relative power levels off of, since having multiple high-tiered combatants fighting right off the bat only serves to muddy any kind of baseline. The other glaring change is probably the fact that I foisted Coffee into the spotlight as Ruby's mentor figures. 
This is done in order to establish a goal for Team Ruby to reach, that of a second year team, and to better observe each of Ruby's members' personalities, flaws and all. It allows the characters to open up not to each other, but to neutral voices of reason, which help us understand what measures need to happen for them to improve as people and teammates. It also allows us to see the other side of Cardin's bullying and mirror his racism with Weiss's in the form of Velvet's torture, while also allowing us a small taste of closure and payback for her suffering. Because damn it, that adorable little bunny girl needs to be protected and loved! With all that touched upon, I want to thank you all for watching through this monster of a video. I know it's quite possibly been a slog in some places, especially where I was effectively recapping events that happened unmolested from the original version. However, all of this, this entire video, is only my opinion on how Ruby should have been handled. Feel free to agree or disagree, but as always, leave your thoughts in the comments down below. Just be sure to keep debates and arguments civil and genial. We're all fans of Ruby here, no need to be belligerent to one another. Like the first two videos, thoughtful critique and fitting additions or thoughts will be addressed in a second, more candid video, so I implore you keyboard warriors to get started. Though, maybe use bullet points if you have a post longer than three paragraphs? It makes reading long comments so much easier. Shout out to Fat Man Falling for helping me edit the script to this video, and a huge shout out to Moderately Entertain for creating editing, and maintaining the Adding Flavor to Remnant Google document, which you can check out down in the description below. Feel free to add your own ideas, just be sure not to step on anyone's toes down there, eh? Once more, thank you so much for sitting through this video, and a loving shout out to my patrons for supporting me and my work. I couldn't do it without any of you. But until next time, folks, catch you on the flip side.